All right, let's open up our Bibles to James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. We was in these verses last week. We'll continue on and we'll, we will talk a little bit about what we talked about last week. Kind of uh, catch everybody up a little bit at some point uh, to kind of connect the two. But James 1, verses 13 through 15, when you get there, please stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word. <coughs> Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you again, thankful and blessed for your word. Lord, it is a blessing that we have the Holy Bible, Lord, to, that you can speak to us through, through the authors that, that wrote it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit years ago. And I just pray this morning, Lord, that it's your word that is proclaimed. Lord, that uh, myself as an unworthy vessel, Lord, that uh, you, you hide me. And Lord, that your son Jesus Christ comes forth. And Lord, we just want to thank you so much for this day, the service we've had thus far. And Lord, I, I pray that... Uh, as being a family of God, Lord, that we can encourage each other and help one another. Lord, some of us, this is the only time we see each other this week, Lord, and, and I just pray that uh, we are a blessing to each other, that everyone is better off for being around everyone else that is here today. Lord, we just want to thank you. Lord, we want to praise you for your son Jesus Christ, through, through him that we have it all. And Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen. So as long as humans have walked the earth, there has been sin. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And as long as there has been sin, there has been blame. There has been people blaming others for their failures. As soon as Adam and Eve were confronted with eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was somebody else's fault. Adam blamed God for giving him Eve and he blamed Eve for giving him the fruit. Then Eve blamed the snake. And then the snake had no legs to stand on. I thought that was pretty good. But I'm surprised they didn't blame God for planting the tree. Well, if that tree hadn't have been there, I wouldn't have wanted to eat the fruit. It's kind of like you blaming the light company for you hitting the telephone pole or telephone company. Well, if they hadn't have put that light pole there, I would not have hit it. And we have that mentality. It's human nature. It, you know, it goes back, it's human nature to sin starting at Genesis 3, and it's human nature to blame somebody else for our problems. That it's somebody else's fault. And we see the examples of it all through Scripture. We don't have to hang around people that much to see the examples in our daily life. If you've got kids, you see it. I don't know that there's ever been a time that my kids have owned up to it without blaming somebody else, whatever they've done wrong. It's human nature. It happens. Even in the, in the book of Exodus in 32, when Moses is coming down from Mount Sinai, and he's always got the Ten Commandments in his hands, and, and him and Joshua's walking down, and they hear the, the noise of a party. And they go down and they find out that the Israelites have built the golden calf. Moses was upset, as he should have been. And he so upset that maybe he shouldn't have done this, throw down the, you know, the tablets and broke them. But he asked Aaron, why? Why did you do this? Why did you build this golden calf? You know what Aaron said? Aaron said, well, thou knowest the people, they are set on mischief. So to kind of update the language there, so you know them. They've, out, they've, they've got mischief on their minds all the time. So he's the one that tells them, all right, take all your gold jewelry and we're going to burn, we're going to burn it down, we're going to 
And out of the fire came this golden calf. He said, these are the gods that freed you out of Egypt. Aaron had, did all that. He, he bore some responsibility, but he said, but you know them. Always set on mischief. Not wanting to follow God. He was blaming somebody else. We see in 1 Samuel 15 when Saul was fighting the Amalekites and he spared King Agag and he was supposed to utterly destroy everything. Leave nothing. And that sounds brutal. And it is. But that was the command that he got from God. And you see when Samuel come back and, and Saul's saying, yeah, we've had a great victory in battle. We've done great things. And Samuel's like, well, what's this bleeding of sheep in my ears? Why do I hear these animals? And Saul says, well, the people, the soldiers, they took of the spoil that was supposed to be destroyed. That's what he said. He blamed, you know, here he was, the king and the general, the leader of the army. He had complete dominion over every single person that was with him in that battle. And then he acted like he had no control over them. Well, they took the spoil. Blaming somebody else. And I talked last week about how a lot of times we tend to want to blame God as well. And we go back in, in verse 13, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Because James said, look, don't even try blaming God for your problems, for your sin, for falling into temptation. Because for one, you know, if God can't be tempted and he cannot tempt people, he's good. Okay, and the definition of that word good, as we talked about in the fruits of the Spirit, is that he is morally right, morally perfect. Yet we have people still blaming God for their sinful attitudes, their actions, their desires. And here's what you hear a lot of times nowadays is that, well, God made me this way. And when I hear that, it makes me, and this is a bad reaction, but it makes me want to pinch somebody's head off because no, He didn't. God didn't make you sinful. God cannot do that. When we look at back at Genesis, God formed Adam from the dust. He formed Eve from Adam's rib. And ever since the fall, sinful man and sinful woman have come together to make more sinful men and sinful women. Now God forms our soul. He forms our spirit. But this vessel that we live in is naturally sinful. That comes from the fall. The sin nature that we have, it comes from our fathers and our mothers and our grandfathers and our grandmothers all the way down through history. We can't even blame Satan for our sin. You know, I, I think I don't I think there was a comedian that coined the phrase, well, the devil made me do it. We can't even use that. We do not have that excuse because we're responsible to ourselves. So like I said last week, Satan's going to pay for the stumbling blocks that, he, that he's laid in our way. He's going to have to answer for that. And we're going to have to answer for the stumbling. Because that is on us. So James is telling us here, we may be tempted, we may be enticed, but it is our own lust and desires that draws us away. Verse 14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. It's what's in our heart. Genesis 6, 5. This is before the flood. And it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. So I'm saying everything that they thought about was set on evil. Now, and that's talking about human beings. And some might say, well, that, that group of humans was wiped out in the flood and good and just Noah, you know, passed on his good heart. Well, we got to remember it says Noah found grace in the eyes of God. That means God had to be merciful, for, merciful on him because he had a bad heart too. Jeremiah 17, 9. 
tells us the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? That is what's in your heart. Wickedness. The Bible says that it is desperately wicked. And so when we see the temptations that it draws from our own lusts, our own desires, our own heart. When we see the word drown here in verse 14, there are a couple of definitions for the original Greek word and, and both of them apply. And, and I'll talk about both of them. One literally means to be dragged away. As a matter of fact, some Bible translations will even use the word dragged in this verse. And we often equate dragging to, do, to being something against our will. Okay? It's not something that we want to follow. It's not something that we want to do. It's against our will. If, if, uh, if my kids don't want to go to school, we may have to drag them to school. You know, you've heard the joke uh, that some people may say, well, when I was a kid, we had a drug problem. My parents drugged me to church. You know, against their, you know, there's a lot, there's many kids that don't want to go to church. It's the truth. But that's, why, that's the way we equate dragging with, is that it's against our will. And we even look at, uh, say, if we've got uh, <clears throat> kids that are growing up or even in their early 20s, and, and they're hanging around with a group of people that we don't particularly care for. And we may say, well, that group of people is dragging them down. Now, as I alluded to earlier, you know, I think we're often quick when we have teenagers, we'll blame their friends a lot of times for the things they may get into. But, as I alluded to earlier, most of it's what's already in their heart. And that's coming out. We can't blame the sins of our sweet little angels on their friends all the time when they're going along with it. You, they make that choice. We have that personal responsibility. When Jesus said that we're going to answer for every idle word and action, I don't have to answer for anybody else's, but I've got to answer for mine. Now, when being dragged or, or drawn away by our own lust, we still have some choices there. It's not against our will. One, we can fight. Now, there's some I've seen some stories in the news uh, here lately, and I want to be respectful, but there was a there was a there was a woman in Florida that got drugged away by an alligator, and then I saw something else in Australia. There's a crocodile that drugged the family pet into the water as a dog. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but to use that kind of analogy. You know, when you're being, when a person or, or an animal is being drug away by like something like an alligator or a crocodile, you can fight. You can choose to just let them pull you under the water, or you can fight. Same thing when we look at Satan as, as a roaring lion seeking to whom he may devour, and if he gets a hold of us, we can fight, or we can let him devour us. You know, you hear things like if you get attacked by a shark, poke it in the eye or punch it in the nose or whatever. We have to fight. Paul wrote, be angry and sin not. That means it's going to take some effort, it's going to take some fervor, it's going to take some fight to fight against sin. And sin ought to make us angry a little bit. Whether it be ours or somebody else's. Look in the book of Jude, verse 23 says, and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment that is spotted by the flesh. And so Paul says, be angry and sin not. So Paul's upset. You see him get upset because he sins. And he hates it. He said, the things that I do, I hate. I don't want to do them. And then you see Jude, which is also Jesus' brother, writing here, that you hate even the garment that's spotted by the flesh. The things that sin affects. The things that sin defiles. You hate even that. Don't you think that we ought to have the same attitude? That we ought to hate sin? We ought to hate sin in all of its many manifestations. 
when it comes out in our attitude towards certain things or our actions that we commit, we ought to hate that. We ought to hate all kinds of sin. You look in, in the book of Acts and Paul's right walking through Athens and he says he sees all the idolatry going on and he sees it stirred him in his heart. You know what that did? That stirred him up. He was mad because he saw all this sin around him. And we can, we can walk out into the world today and there's a lot of sin out there and, and all around us and it doesn't bother us. I'll just... I worship God like I worship God. Keep my faith personal, and that's their choice. They're going to have to answer for that. That's, you know, and that and that's true. But that ought to tick us off. For one, sin is why God had to send His Son to die for it. That ought to make us angry. We ought to be mad about it, especially when we're the ones doing it. You know, sin manifests itself in, in many ways. And, and all those manifestations, like I said, we ought to hate them. But yet we have certain things, certain pet sins or certain sinful attitudes or actions or what have you. It kind of goes back to, well, this is just how I am. And that's not how God designed you. Every sinful attitude, action that we may have, the people around us may have, we ought to be angry about it. Instead, it doesn't bother us. We, we have become so apathetic and complacent in this world that people are dying and go to hell or living in sin and leading other people astray that it doesn't bother us. You know, that's our, if we're born again, that's our old man, the flesh, that we're called to put to death. And you know, sometimes we've got we to fight awful hard to make that old flesh, that old man, stay dead. Going back to being dragged away and being drowned and what the word means, the other choice we have in being dragged away, and, and keeping with that alligator analogy, and I mentioned the crocodile and the dog in Australia. The reason that it even made news, because I'm wondering why is this even in the news? Evidently, the dog had harassed that crocodile for years and he would chase it back into the water. And finally, that crocodile had enough and he decided to make the dog dinner. So, the other option we have with sin trying, and our own lust trying to drag us is in keeping with that analogy, don't go near the water. Don't go near it. You know, a little, and this is a little dog, a little dog going and barking at an alligator and harassing, you're asking to get eat. You know, you hear the phrase, you play with fire, you're going to get burned. You play with fire, you're asking to get burned. You play with sin, you're asking to fall. You know, if you have issues with how you act around certain people, whether they take you into conversations and subjects that you need not be talking about, for one, you can confront them about it and say, look, I don't need to be talking about this. And if they don't change, you stay away. It's pretty simple. It's drastic, but it's pretty simple. You know, if you know you have a certain weakness, you need to stay away from that. So that temptation doesn't grow and it doesn't fester and it doesn't conceive and bring forth sin. Like it talks about in verse 15. You know, and I may get extreme here. If, if you have issues with what's being shown on TV and it takes your thoughts somewhere that it doesn't need to go, keep the TV turned off. That's pretty simple. If you have issues with getting on the internet or, or using your phone too much or whatever, put it up. Stay off of it. You know, because those bring forth temptation in our life. I, I love this example. You go back to the book of Genesis and Joseph and he's serving Potiphar and Potiphar's wife is trying to seduce him. And Joseph does his best to stay away. Because for one, he knows he's a man. He's probably he's weak. He knows his weaknesses. And so he just stays away and, and she tries to grab him and drag him into sin. And what's he do? He fights and he runs. And you know what? A lot of thanks he got. He got put in jail after that. But that was alright. You know what? His heart was clean. 
He was pure. He didn't fall into that. Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And so when we look at that phrase, make provision, do we know what that means? You know, it's to provide for. You know, it's the same root word, to provide for. Or to feed. To take care of. So, Paul's telling us in Romans, he's like, look, don't provide any opportunity for the flesh. Don't, don't let that flesh manifest itself. Don't let that flesh bring you down. Don't even give it a chance. You know, that, and that's part of living a holy life is staying separate from those things that takes you away from God. And so looking back at the other definition of drawn in verse 14 of James 1, it also means to lure, to draw, and entice something, mainly like in hunting. Right? And when somebody's hunting something, they'll bait it and draw it out into the open and the, and the hunter, the predator, the devourer kills it. That's the purpose. You go hunting, the purpose is to kill. Death is the result of us giving in to sin. The desires combine with the actions. Okay, we have the, the lust in our hearts and we combine those with the actions and they conceive and, and sin is brought forth. Because in verse 15, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The original sin brought death into the world. Okay? It's hard for us to imagine, but Adam and Eve living in the garden, fellowshipping with God, walking with Him, talking with Him, there was no death. Nothing died, nothing wore out, nothing grew old. But God told him, when you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will die. And it didn't happen immediately, but death was brought into that world. Brought into this world at that time. That's why we have sicknesses. That's why we have illnesses. That, that's why we have, you know, that, that things wire out and things fade away. And unless people confront that sin in their life, and repent and become born again, they go to the final death, which is hell. And see, and, and y'all may get tired of hearing this, there's a lot of people in churches every Sunday that has never truly confronted that and repented. They've went through some motions, and, and, and they've went through some rituals, but they've never gave up their sin. They've never confronted their sin. Their only sin was they wasn't in church, maybe. Is why they look at it. That lust is also conceived when we dwell on those thoughts, those actions. Or we entertain them. And, and the Bible is pretty clear. One way to stay away from things like that is to dwell on the things of God. John Owen has this quote. He says, Fill your affection with the cross of Christ that there may be no room for sin. Fill your affection with the cross of Christ that there be no room for sin. When you're dwelling on Jesus Christ and the cross and what He did and what He means to your salvation, your eternity, you're going to be less likely to sin. That, that's, that's facts. You see, you know, Paul writes in Philippians, you know, whatever things are true, whatever things are ju just, you know, think on these things. We mentioned Romans 13, 14 a while ago. It said, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Don't provide for the flesh, but put on Jesus Christ. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verses 9 through 11. It's just a couple of books before the book of James. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. And it's talking about people that are rich. 
Okay, but this, this kind of has a broad meaning. So in verse 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Okay, he's talking about money is one of those things that bring people into sin. And it tells why here. It says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you have a problem with the love of money, the best way to fix it is give it away. Not worry about it. Give it away. And don't get yourself tied down to things where you have to pay something every month. That's the, you know, because then if you have to have a certain amount of money every month, you're consumed with making that much money every month. And there's a lot of people that like their money a whole lot more than they like their family, than they like God. Adrian Rogers used to always say, you know you've gotten to a man's heart. Christ has gotten to a man's heart when he's gotten into his wallet. And that's the truth. And then in verse 11 in 1 Timothy chapter 6, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. And so he's, he's saying, look, don't, don't go after those things. Don't let those sinful things or things that may lead to sin consume you. Follow after righteousness. Follow after faith. Follow after holiness. Follow after God. Follow after Jesus Christ. Galatians 5.16 Paul writes, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we're walking in the Spirit in everything that we do, Paul tells us you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're following the Spirit, the Spirit's not going to lead you astray. The Spirit's not going to lead you into sin. Going back to our heart. Our heart's wicked. It's sinful. It's deceitful. It's, it's dirty. It's black. That's what's inside of us. That's what we're born with. I saw something else. Is how can a, a person be new or have a new heart unless they put the old one to ashes? Unless they burn it first. And that makes sense. You know, Paul or uh, Isaiah writes about there's beauty from ashes. Or he'll, he'll ch God tells Isaiah, I'll bring beauty from ashes. You know, we have this sin nature. We have this old self. This self that basically wants to condemn us to die. That, that is our heart. That's what's in our heart. And, you know, and, and even when we're born again, it takes a fight sometimes to fight against that. The attitudes and the nature that we have. It, it, it's it's going to be a continuous, ongoing fight throughout our whole existence as we walk this earth. From the time that we're born again to the time that we're laid in the ground. Our heart, our heart condemns us. You know, it's, James tells us that it, it's our lust that's within us, and then our heart condemns us. That's what sins. But 1 John 3.20 tells us, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. We're born into sin. You know, we have these lusts these desires that's within our heart. But John tells us that God is greater than our heart. You know, no matter what we're going through, no matter what sin is in our life, no matter what conviction we have, we know that God is greater than our heart. The fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross, there's not a sin that that doesn't cover when we run to the cross. We believe in the cross and we stand on the cross. God knows exactly what we were and are capable of. He knows what's inside us. He knows what we think about. 
He knows what we desire. He knows how we'll even act after we get become born again, after we become saved. He knows every bit of that, yet He still chose to send His Son to die for our sins that we can be saved. You know, we bear our personal responsibility for our sins. That's what James is telling us. But Jesus Christ bore every bit of that on the cross. That is good news. That's, that's something that we ought to be thankful for every day. There's no sin, there's no temptation, there's no attitude, there's no action that we can't overcome with the cross of Jesus Christ. Again, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to answer for any unrepented of sin when we stand at the judgment. But I pray and I hope that there's nobody in within the sound of my voice that when they, when they stand at judgment, and I don't know how that's going to go. All of our sins throughout all our life may be read to us. And then it's asked, what is your defense? Jesus. Jesus say, I died for every one of those. He repented of every one of those. That's the, that's the glory, that's the praises that we have continually, daily. That ought to make us think. That ought to make us uh, look at life differently. But yet, you know, a lot of times we're, we're content to wallow in sin. When we, and we want to blame somebody else or, or what have you. God says, no, that's on you. The prodigal son, he realized it. He says, look, I, I'm, I'm in this mud, this mire, and it's all my fault but I have a Father. And we can know and stand on that, that we have a Father. No matter how far into sin we fall, we have a Father and we have a Savior that died for our sins. So as Cleet and Cheryl come up this morning for our invitation, look, this is... We do the same thing every week. But if you need prayer, if you need to be born again, if you need to rededicate yourself, you want to pray with somebody or you need somebody to pray for you, don't hesitate to use the altar. If you've got somewhere to go, I don't think most people's feelings will be hurt if you turn around and leave and go out. But, you know, we have this time together so people can pray with one another to fellowship with one another. If you want to go somewhere else and do it, that's fine too. But if you're called to do it here, do it here. Whatever, whatever the need may be. Let us stand and sing.